Build my home on hollow ground. Too proud to Hi, this is Craig Smith with a new podcast about artificial intelligence. Each week I speak with leading researchers in the space, and this week I talk to Peter Abiel, one of the world's foremost experts on learning systems for robots. Peter is a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, where he runs the Berkeley Artificial Intelligence Research Lab. With colleagues, he has also founded Covariant AI, a company that builds intelligent robots for industry. We spoke about his work in one-shot and few-shot learning, strategies for robots to learn from limited demonstrations, and about robot memories and the prospect of robots with personalities eventually assisting in the home. I hope you find the conversation as instructive as I did. Cross it to find your synthetic light. To begin, I thought maybe for the benefit of listeners that don't follow the intersection of AI and robotics necessarily, and a lot of people think of AI as robotics in the popular culture, if you could sort of give a brief summary of how AI has been introduced into robotics kind of the history and where it stands today, and then we'll talk about where it'll go. Sure, yeah. So if you think about kind of the interplay of artificial intelligence and robotics, a robot really has two parts to it. There is the physical and there is the brain of the robot. Mm -hmm. And the brain, of course, is the AI part. The physical has seen a lot of innovation, but I would say has been pretty much the same for many years now. If you go look at car manufacturers, you go look at electronics manufacturers and so forth, you see a bunch of robots doing all kinds of things. But these robots haven't really changed. They're robots designed to be really good for high precision, repeated motion, doing the same yeah. thing over and over and over, and they're extremely good at it. Now, when we think about intelligent robots, that's typically not what we would think about. We think about intelligent robots, we don't think of always doing the same thing. We would think of maybe a robot that could, I don't know, organize our laundry, or maybe do complicated surgery, or maybe could load our dishwasher, or maybe, you know, assemble something it's never seen before, just be given the CAD drawings, and just say, oh, I understand now what to do, give me the parts, I'll just assemble it for you. And so the latter are the kind of examples of problems that we like to think about here in my lab at Berkeley because they really challenge what's possible mm. with current robots and specifically challenge the AI capabilities we have and give us a very good reality check about what we can do. It's very easy to look at things back. Like, oh my God, isn't AlphaGo like robots? Because robots have to make decisions, AlphaGo makes decisions, but it's very, very different because AlphaGo is a very constrained environment. It's amazing. It's a big breakthrough result, but it's still on a board. And that board has specific rules and is always the same. Whereas for a robot organizing laundry, everything's gonna be different every time. A robot loading a dishwasher, things gonna be different every time. A robot assembling something it's never assembled before, it has to think all the way through what that might mean. And so those are very hard problems, made even harder by the fact that often real world and simulator aren't all that well matched up. And so even if you get something working in simulation, it might still not work in the real world. Is that one of the reasons why you work with physical robots rather than simply simulation? So there's a couple of reasons I like working with physical robots. And I also have, I have two different hats. I'm a professor at Berkeley mm -hmm. and I'm founder of a company called Covariant. Mm -hmm. At Covariant, we build artificial intelligence for robotic automation. And there we really focus on can we make robots do things that people before couldn't make robots do. And you go to the factory, it's all repeated motion now. Well, with the right AI, you should be able to do much smarter things. At Berkeley, it's not so much about can we get this or that working, it's more about can we advance the state of artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. And can we use robots as a way to measure our progress? And often it's very easy. You think you make a lot of progress, you know, amazing result, and then you try it on a robot, then it doesn't work. Because the real world is just very unforgiving. And in fact, very often you might just see a three-year-old do a bunch of stuff and you say, well, why can't the robot do it? And it gives you a real reality check how far we are still away from having intelligent robots. And so the robot at Berkeley really forms kind of a challenge and a reality check and also motivates a lot of things we think about. Maybe you say, oh, we should just go from an image to a representation of a few coordinates of the things that are in the image. But then you say, what if I'm dealing with liquids? I can't just summarize that in a few coordinates. What if I'm dealing with laundry? That's not just a couple of coordinates. It's a lot more detailed. And so often you get challenged very quickly once you try to do interesting things with a real robot. And then the plus, the extra added bonus is with a real robot, if you get it working, it's often useful. If you can really make something work, people can benefit from it. You've written a lot about one-shot teaching through video or demonstration and self-play. 
which of those is likely to be implemented in the real world once the hardware has reached the level that they can operate? Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting question. So which one will have the most impact? And if you look at papers we write, you might be inclined to think it must be about this one or that one or yet the other one. And that's because a lot of research tries to kind of isolate specific capabilities and see how much progress can we make when we look specifically at few shot reinforced learning or few shot imitation learning or maybe hierarchical reinforced learning and so forth. In practice, when we want to get something working, usually you have to bring a lot of these things together. And it's not as separate as you think from a lot of research papers where it's really focused on something very specific to try to make progress in that specific axis that we're studying. If I think about the different components, I think a lot about also how do robots stack up against humans? Reinforced learning is great, learning from your own trial and error, but it takes forever when you start from scratch. But humans don't typically start from scratch, they've learned other things before. They might have learned other things implicitly through evolution and mm -hmm. might be in our DNA that we're ready to do something more easily thanks to evolution. Humans watch other people and are able to imitate. Actually, they're able to understand how what somebody else does maps onto their own body and how they would be doing, which is actually a very complex type of imitation because you've got to think about more than just, I'm already doing it, but somebody's puppeteering me and now I'm going to do it myself, which is often how robot teaching happens, to actually watching a different person, different body doing it. And so the reason a lot of the recent work I've been doing is on few shot learning is because I think that's where there's a lot of opportunity. If you think about standard imitation learning, standard reinforcement learning, it's great. I mean, with in the limit of infinite data, certainly it gets very far. But to make things practical, you want a robot that, when given a new task, can immediately learn the new thing and can build on everything it's learned before. And so the assembly setup is a good example. Once a robot has learned to assemble thousands of things, the thousand and first thing, let's say, should be much easier. It shouldn't take as long to learn that. And so that to me is a very intriguing question. How do you somehow index into that past experience? And that doesn't mean you need to keep a video around, but you somehow, typically in a neural network, somehow store things about that past experience that allow you to more easily learn something new. That's one thing I don't understand about what you're doing. Neural nets remember in the weights, mm -hmm. right, of the layers. With something like few-shot learning or one-shot learning or imitation or self-play, any of that, where is that experience being stored? By mm -hmm. extension, Bert, is that the name of your robot? Brett. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brett. If it's been doing self-play, for example, is that knowledge accumulating or do you reset and start from scratch every time you start a new experiment? Yeah, the question, how do we accumulate knowledge? And the standard way it's accumulated in neural networks, kind of feed forward neural networks that are often using computer vision, let's yeah. say, for recognizing what's in an image, is you feed a lot of examples. Input is an image, output some annotated version of the image. Maybe it says it's a cat in this part of the image, a dog in that part, and so forth. And the neural net gets trained to automatically make those predictions about what's in the image. And after all the data has been passed through, all the experience, in some sense, is summarized in the weights, the strengths of the connections between the neurons in the neural network. It's not the only way to store information, though. There are other ways to do things. For example, you might explicitly keep some things around. So sometimes in imitation learning, we might say, if we want to do one-shot imitation learning, what it really means is that if we're given a video of a demonstration, we should be able to index into that video to be able to do the right thing now. So give me one video and I can now also do it, but I get to index and refer back to that video very explicitly as I'm doing my own execution to know what to do. And so for example, the first one shot and few shot imitation results was by Rocky Duan, one of the former PhD student here and was also at OpenAI, now founder of Covariant, was doing exactly that. It had learned to index into a single demonstration to understand what to do when needing to solve the same task. But of course, not exactly the same task, not the same motions. It's just maybe somebody, you know, shows how to set a table in a certain style and now you have to set another table in the same style and you get to index into that video to understand what you need to do. But that's one way. Then in later work, that I'm still not clear which in long run is going to be the right way to do it, another student here, Chelsea Finn, showed that it's possible to also learn from one demonstration by watching that one demonstration and doing updates to the weights in the network and have the network be ready to re-execute on that task after that. And both of them work great. So it's kind of interesting to see that there's these two different mechanisms mm. and both of them seem to work. And then a whole other line of work, which is a little less active these days, but was very active a couple of years ago, and these things always you know, come back at some point, was the work on neural Turing machines. So this is work from Alex Graves and collaborators out of DeepMind, essentially setting up a neural network that explicitly has access to a memory. 
and it can store things away in a memory and retrieve things from the memory to solve problems. Mm. And so there's all these kind of things happening and it's not that well understood yet what is the right way. And probably it's a combination of all of these and certain things maybe should be stored explicitly as experiences you can index into and rewatch the video, so to say. And other things maybe you want to internalize in the weights and it's not very clear. Just on the question mm -hmm. of robots that are working on salt plate, do they accumulate that? Are you indexing or storing mm -hmm. that knowledge somehow? So when I think about self play, let me take a step back maybe and kind of what context it becomes important. So when I think about self play, we really think about reinforcement learning, systems that are learning from their own trial and error. And often if you just run reinforcement learning as is, learning is pretty slow. But if you can formulate your problem as a self-play problem, meaning your agent plays against itself, the learning is often a lot faster. Why is that? If you just have to learn something without having self-play, you're just trying to learn, let's say, learn to run or learn to stack a block or maybe learn to cook a meal, the feedback in reinforced learning is some scoring of how well you're doing. But that scoring doesn't come in very frequently. Once you complete something, you might say, well done, and if you fail, then it says not well done. And so the feedback is very sparse, makes it very hard to learn. The best analogy I think a lot of people know about is training a dog. When you train a dog, if you give it at the end of the day just a feedback, hey dog, this was a great day, and another day you say, well, this is not a great day, it's not gonna learn anything. Because the day was so long, it doesn't understand what was good or bad about it. And that's really the challenge in reinforcement learning. The more feedback you give, the easier to learn. That's why you talk to your dog the whole time through, you say, well done, well done, oh no, 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 and that way the dog learns more quickly. Same thing for our reinforcement learning agents. The more feedback we can give, the faster they're going to learn. Now the question is, how do you give that feedback? Do you want to really sit there and continuously give feedback? Well, that kind of defeats the purpose. You might as well give demonstrations, it's very tedious too, but at least you're showing how to do it right. Mm. And so if you don't want to sit there the whole time giving feedback, then probably you typically write some piece of code that gives feedback. It's going to be very sparse. But if it's a game like Go, or we've done some work where there's games where there is two robots that sumo wrestle each other. They sumo wrestle each other and what happens is initially they're all pretty bad. But from wrestling each other, when the same neural net plays against itself, half the time it wins, half the time it loses. And that's the way you maximize signal and you learn all the time. Compare that to you learn to sumo wrestling, you wrestle against a pro sumo wrestler and they always beat you and you're like, okay, no matter what I do, I'm always gonna lose and you learn nothing. There's nothing to be learned. You're always gonna lose, that's what you get. But by playing against people of your own level or playing against yourself if you can mm -hmm. and you make some slight variations in how you play, you can see what variations help you and gradually build up. And so that had really nice results with robots essentially wrestling each other. Had some nice results with robots learning to play soccer, penalty kicking and goalie. Then there were some nice results DeepMind had with AlphaGo Zero rather than the original right. AlphaGo. And then OpenAI, actually before that, had some new, really nice results with Dota 2 also learn through self-play. So I think whenever you can turn things into self-play, you're essentially maximizing the signal you give to your reinforcement learning agent. It's not always clear how to do it. For many problems, it's not clear. Imagine you want a cooking robot. How are you gonna turn that into a self-play game? I'm not sure. If somebody can do it, they should do it, and I'll probably will learn really quickly. But nobody's really figured out how to generally turn things into self-play. And it may be a combination, right? You may, in training an AI to control a robot, you may do mm -hmm. self-play initially uh -huh. and then do something at the one shot or a few shot imitation. You might bring them all together, absolutely. Yeah. So when you think about, okay, few shot imitation or a few shot RL and self-play, you can imagine that you're trying to learn to play a wide range of games and the rules could change on you a lot. Or the type of player you play against can change a lot. You could do few shot learning where you immediately adapt to the style of your opponent to more easily beat that opponent than if you kind of had a fixed strategy that does not adapt. Yeah, and one of the things that you referenced in one of the talks I listened to was, I think it was at OpenAI to train this hopping robot simply through verbal cues. <laughs> Yeah, so I think the work you're referring to is some work by Paul Cristiano at OpenAI showing yeah, that, that when you want to teach a hopper robot to do backflips, well, how are you going to do that? How are you going to specify what is a backflip? In fact, I went through the same challenge as a PhD student who were working on autonomous helicopter flight. How do you even specify what it means to do all these tricks? You're going to type out some reward function to score it? Back then, we hired a professional pilot to demonstrate and we learned what it means to do a backflip, to do a front flip, to do a loop, all those things. And in this new work, what Paul was looking at was essentially, instead of getting a expert, can you do it with scoring it? So being live in the loop, say this was better than the other one. 
And then when it does underneath, it'll then say, oh, the reward function I'm supposed to optimize must achieve higher score on this one than the other one. And over time, it learns a reward function, just much like we learned the reward function from the human pilot demonstrations at the time. This reward function was learned from feedback of comparisons between attempts. And on the hopper backflip, how was the signal given? So for the backflip specific one, the hopper doing backflips, it would just do two runs and you would say which one is better. Right, yeah. Because you can envision getting a robot or an AI that's controlling a robot to the point where it would be in your house. But then if you could use verbal cues or some mechanical mm -hmm. interface that would give the cues. Absolutely. You, you want it to learn new things when it's in your home. You don't want it to be just a fixed machine that just does what it's factory programmed to do. You want it to be a machine that comes in and that knows your house and your preferences are going to be different from anybody else's house, anybody else's preferences. And you want it to be able to few shot, hopefully, rather than 10,000 or million shots, hopefully a few shots adapt to what you care about. Yeah. And you exactly want to give that kind of feedback. Just what's better, what's worse is only one bit of information. It's not a whole lot of information going, but if you could talk to it, people look at that too. You essentially, when you talk to it, you're giving it some information about how to solve the problem or about what the reward function is that you really care about. And then it can start optimizing against it. Yeah. How long do you think before all of this study will be integrated in a robot that then can actually mm -hmm. operate in that kind of setting? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. And from when I started at Berkeley, this was in 2008, mm -hmm. a lot of my motivation was there was this beautiful video out of Willow Garage, essentially PR1 robot showing that it can do a lot of the chores that we wish robots would be doing for us. But the catch was that this robot was teleoperated. Artificial intelligence was not ready to make it happen, but the robot was ready. Just like Bread here, which is a successor right. of that robot, Berkeley robot for elimination of tedious tasks. That, we named it that way because we want this robot to come and help and make sure we don't have to all the things, cleaning, organizing, cooking, the robot can do it, laundry, all of that. The first thing we did when I got to Berkeley was exactly that. We said, let's try to solve laundry folding. And we pushed it so hard for two years, we pushed super hard in it. At the end of two years, we had a demo that people were completely surprised by that this was even possible. We had a robot organizing a pile of towels, very reliably, succeed every time. But it was two years of work and two years of really, really good students working on it. And it was still a very constrained environment, very constrained setting. I mean, it was towels. I mean, there's many other things than towels. It was using that specific table. Towels of, you know, not any size, you know, limited size, all those things, right? Then you're like, okay, wow, this took a long time. This is around 2010, we got those results. But the dream always stayed there. Like we really want to get robots into the home and adapt to every possible scenario. Around that time, a little later, we started realizing there's only so far we can go if we need to we do everything ahead of time ourselves. We really need to put even more learning into this. I mean, of course, had a lot of learning already because otherwise you can't see what's around it. Computer vision has been doing my learning for a long time. But to have it learn even more, learn behaviors. And that's why around 2011, 12, we really started pushing hard on the deep reinforcement learning direction. Mm -hmm. The robot can automatically keep improving. However, it remains really challenging. So I think the best way to think of it, what makes things easier or hard for a robot? It's not exactly what's easier or hard for people. Mm -hmm. It's more how much variation is there in the robot environment and the objects it has to deal with. And the less variation, the more feasible it is. And it might be hard for humans, like a robot might do high precision painting, but it's always painting that same car in the exact same way, so there is no variation in its job, so it can keep doing that thing over and over. Something really simple, like, you know, everybody knows about Amazon's picking challenge, right? Mm -hmm. You need to pick things out of a shelf or out of a bin and right. put in another bin. You know, like that seems so much easier than painting or welding. I mean, clearly painting and welding are much harder in principle, but getting a robot to do painting and welding, long solved problem, getting a robot to pick something out of a bin, that's still a challenge. Yeah. And so it's this big mismatch and that's where personally I see like, okay, I love to get robots in the home and I can see it happen some point in the future. But the more directly solvable problems are when you still impose a bit more structure on your environment. And so that's exactly why for Kaverin, we're focused on more structured environments like factories, warehouses, and so forth, where you have a bit more control. Yeah. The robot has to be smart, but doesn't have to solve like coming into a completely new house that's never been in before, with a person with completely new preferences of how things should be done, and understand all of that very quickly, or people will be like, this robot is useless, it doesn't do what I ask it to do. Part of what you're expressing frustration about is transfer learning, right? that we talked about storing knowledge mm -hmm. that robots gain mm -hmm. through different learning protocols, mm -hmm. but how do you transfer that learning to mm -hmm. a new environment or a new uh -huh. task? 
two questions. How does transfer learning work? Is it going in and relearning something through yeah, it's one a, of these it's a very good videos? Mm-hmm. Or is there some other reasoning mm-hmm. that has to take place? Yeah, so transfer learning is about learning the next thing more quickly because you've learned other things before. Yeah. And sometimes it's a lot like few shot learning. It's very related. Because few shot learning is also about after training on a lot of things, now the next thing should be quicker. And so if you look at what's happening underneath in both few shot learning and transfer learning, a lot of what's happening is that these tasks are very related that you're trying to solve. Mm-hmm. And when you try to solve related tasks, In fact, let me give a very simple example where people don't really think of it as transfer learning, but everybody does it this way, nobody does it differently. Think about ImageNet challenge, computer vision. You're supposed to recognize into a thousand categories. In principle, you could train a neural network for bird, a separate neural network for horse, for car. I mean, the categories are more refined often than these high level things, but in principle, you could learn a separate neural net for every one of them. But that's not what is done. What's being done is a single neural network with a thousand outputs rather than one network per category. And so what you see there, why would you do that? Why not have a specialized network for cat and a specialized network for dog? Because when you try to recognize a cat or a dog or a horse and car and house, all those things, a lot of what you need to do is share. And so the neural network will take in an image, which is just a bunch of numbers, and process that layer by layer by layer. But a lot of the same processing has to happen for all these problems. And if you train a single network to solve all the problems, it'll actually learn the patterns more quickly. Because when it learns about, oh, I need to detect where some edges in the image are maybe, or maybe I need to detect eyes and where they are. Maybe I detect if something is furry or not. And so all those things are shared across a lot of the tasks. And it's not called transfer there, but effectively there is a transfer happening between the tasks. It's just trained all in one go for all a thousand categories in one big network. Mm -hmm. When you do actual transfer learning, same thing's happening. It's just that some categories don't exist yet. You haven't heard about cat or dog yet. You've already heard about all the other animals. You've trained your network. And because it's learned about all the other animals, now when you say, oh, here are a few examples of cat and dog, well, that network already has the ability to understand a lot of aspects of what an animal might look like and just needs a small number of examples to then be able to classify cat or dog or whatever the new categories are. Is there an example, sort of the most advanced example that you could give me of transfer learning, specifically in robotics? Yeah, so the most advanced example for transfer learning in robotics, I think there are a few. They're mostly in the form of few shot learning. So the first kind of big result for few shot reinforcement learning was Rocky Dwan's result, different paper than the one I mentioned earlier. In few shot reinforcement learning, he showed it's possible that you put an agent in an environment it's never been in before, and it needs to find a destination, but it doesn't know where that destination is, it's just marked by a big red mark. Mm-hmm. And it's just like navigating a maze and has no idea where to go, but then it needs to somehow find a target, it doesn't have a map. And so he used to learn to run down hallways, look around corners, look for the thing it's looking for, remember where it's been before, so effectively internally build a map. And so it was trained on many, many environments and then was tested in new environments. I was able from one or two episodes in a new environment, consistently go find a treasure in that new environment. So that's one example. That was very surprising, at least to me, that that actually worked, because that's a very long-standing problem. Simultaneous localization and mapping slam is a big problem in robotics, but it doesn't even consider itself with actually finding the path, controlling the robot. Another one was also Rocket One, one shot imitation, where it learned from one demonstration what to do. Then Chelsea Finn here did something where she also showed you can do one shot imitation, but now from video rather than from more abstract information about the state. Rocky's work knew the coordinates of the objects. Chelsea showed it's possible just to do it from video. You just give one example of a video how to do it, and then the robot internalizes and does it from that video. So those to me are some of the most impressive examples. In Rocky's case, it was uh, block stacking scenarios, and you show a new configuration and you rumble the blocks around and has learned to build that configuration. From one example, in Chelsea's case, it was putting objects into targets. So there would be a few target locations, for example, a plate or a bowl, things like that. And then you would put maybe a peach into the red plate, and then it would know, okay, now when it's my turn, wherever the red bowl is, I need to find it and put the peach into that red bowl. On this question of retention, so you have a robot and you're gonna have it do something. Do you plug your AI system into that robot, or are you working with a robot with an algorithm or mass collection of algorithms that you're working with each time? So presumably in the case of stacking the blocks and then picking objects, if it's the same system, it should be getting smarter as you Mm -hmm. continue to work with it. Absolutely. Anytime you teach the next thing, it should learn it more quickly. That said, in practice, when doing research, not all research is about that question. So I think of that as a question. A specific research question is, when you learn the next thing, do you learn more quickly? 
And when we're investigating that, we will want it to learn things and then see if it learns more quickly. But it's not always a question we're investigating. Sometimes we investigate the question, how fast can you learn from scratch? Sometimes we investigate the other question, how fast can you learn from maybe some instructions? And so when doing research, it's not so much about, I have a hundred ideas of how robots could learn fast. Let's put them all in one big monster of code and then just, you know, do it. And, oh yeah, our robot learns fast than anybody else's robot because we did a hundred different things on it. No, it's more about, okay, what fundamentally is going to change how fast you can learn if you have learned something else before? How fundamentally can we change how experiences get internalized when a robot watches something? And so it's not really about bringing everything in one place. It's more about fundamentally advancing specific components. Yeah. Is anyone doing that, though? Trying to bolt together all of these ideas and see how far... I'm sure some people are trying. I mean, why not? But it's often not so clear what you necessarily achieve that way. It's often easier to understand what whether you're making progress or not when being more focused on specific aspects of the learning. Yeah. Covariant, can you give me a use case? What kind of systems require that? Sure, yeah. So let me maybe take a step back on that. So when we think about what we want to do at Covariant, is we really want to bring AI capabilities into physical processes, right? Can be robots, can be other machines, but essentially where physical things are involved, bring the AI into it, allow the robot or other machines to do much more advanced things. So a year and a half now, we met with about 200 companies, essentially try to really understand their use cases and what it is that they care about and really what is it that they want to see solved urgently and need solutions at scale versus things, well, nice to have, but don't care as much. And then the other factor we look at is, does it require real AI innovation to solve this problem? Or, you know, maybe it could be solved with traditional automation. They just haven't had a conversation with the traditional automators and they should just go talk to them because they can do it. And why should we use our expertise to solve a problem that can be solved in a way that's long understood? We can't yet share the synthesis from all that because part of what we consider our advantage as a company that we have had these 200 conversations and really have seen what people care about. So it's a little too soon to say exactly what they are. But at the high level, they're all use cases where going beyond the state of the art in AI for robotics that's publicly available is needed to solve these problems. Yeah, things that cannot efficiently be hard coded. Exactly. Yeah. Repeated motion would never succeed, but even things that you see in research labs would typically not be enough. You really need to take things to the next level. Hmm. When is Covariant gonna launch? It's a good question, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Don't know yet. (laughs) Yeah. This, again, is going towards popular notions of robots, and it relates very much to these robots in elder care. Elderly, in particular, want human interaction. You remember Sony had a pet dog, Ibo, Mm -hmm. and then they took it out of service, or they upgraded Uh or something, and suddenly all the old Ibos didn't work. And you had all of these elderly people that had developed emotional attachments Mm -hmm. to these dogs. Even a Roomba, you start Start talking to it, it, or acting like (laughs) it's Mm -hmm. alive. Can you talk a little bit about how robots, the role that they can play in filling those other human needs beyond simply mechanical exercises? Absolutely. I mean, obviously the mechanical will be a big help and give people a lot of independence compared to today. I think robots can have some kind of personality in some sense, right? You can design it into the robot if you want. You can make the robot extra nice or make it humorous, whatever you want. You can probably build that into the way the robot behaves. It's not personally something I spend a lot of time thinking about, but for example, Anka Dragan here at UC Berkeley is one of the world leading experts in human robot interaction, and she is exactly focused on those questions. Is okay, what does it mean to interact with a robot? The human and the robot are in the same space. How does the robot kind of interact, understand what the human is trying to do? How do they really together do things that are really a partnership to get something done rather than just a machine and a human and have them be very distinct? Boston Dynamics. Presumably they're at the forefront of the mechanics, of the hardware. Do you anticipate working with that kind of hardware anytime soon? Because it presumably would be able to do a lot more than the robots you're working with today. Yeah, so absolutely. Boston Dynamics hardware is extremely advanced. I mean, they've been pushing the boundaries for many, many years. Personally, I think it'd be very interesting to work with some of the more capable robots, the humanoid robots that they build or the dog. And when I think about doing research, you think about 
Well, where are the real challenges? Where does the variation come from? It mostly comes from putting new objects in front of the robot. It's not so much whether you have a slightly fancier robot or not, it's more, can you keep bringing new objects over and over and over? Can the robot adapt to them? Can it maybe tie knots in a rope? Can it handle laundry? Can it load a dishwasher? Can it stack Lego blocks? Can it assemble something, assemble yet something else? Can it clean up? And so it's really the range of tasks that I see as the main driving function for making things hard more than a robot that is a little more complicated. I do think ultimately if you care about the final application, but that's different from research. Research is about advancing the intelligence you build for robots. And so it doesn't really matter if your robot physically only has two fingers. Yeah, you're not going to do in-hand manipulation with a two-fingered robot, but it's okay. Because you can think about exactly the same kind of challenges as in-hand manipulation by having maybe many objects that you need to do something with. You get similar challenges that you can make progress on. Mm -hmm. And so usually the challenges are not that problem specific. But if you do want to solve a very specific problem, say I really want to solve this problem, then the more advanced your robot is, the better it's going to work. So from an application point of view, of course, it becomes much more important to have robots that are as advanced as possible also physically. But from an artificial intelligence research point of view with robots, the PR2 that we've had for almost 10 years now serves this function perfectly. There's nothing where we like, oh, we can't do it with PR2, no. We can just give it new challenges every day if we want to. Well, that's it for this week's podcast. I want to thank Peter for his generosity. For those of you who want to go into greater depth about the things we talked about today, you can find a transcript of this show in the program notes. I've put relevant links in the transcript to make it easier to explore the subject further. Our audience is growing, and I'd love to hear from more of you. You can help a lot by rating or reviewing the podcast on whatever podcast platform you use. The singularity may not be near, but AI is about to change your world, so pay attention. Get close to buy my time.